Okay, so we just reviewed the first part of the lecture um, called Laughter is the Best Medicine from Chapter 5, right? We reviewed this part and we talked about some things that our lecturer did and some things that our lecturer did not do. So we know that, well, you know that, right? The lecturer didn't go over a homework assignment, although sometimes that's what lecturers do at the beginning of class. Um, the lecturer, in this case, did not review a previous lesson, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, the lecturer began or started the lecture by doing something unusual or surprising. What did he do? What did he do at the very beginning of the lecture that made everybody laugh? Sound like something he make a sound with his mouth or his head or with his, his table mouth. or his hands or his feet? With his mouth, yeah. Can you make that noise? Something like, yeah. I don't know. I didn't do it very well. He did it. He did it in a well. Now, do you think that's a very usual way for a lecture to begin? No, no that's very unusual, and it made all the students laugh because it seems so odd, so funny. Um, you heard the, the lecture ask some questions, didn't you? Yes, yes, our lecture asked many questions. For example, he asked, what are you laughing at? Remember when he made the sound and then the students, the students say, is that so funny? Do you remember he said that? And he said, what are you laughing at? Yeah, and uh, do you remember when he said, what if I t ask you to stop laughing now? Yeah, so what if I ask you to stop laughing now? So what do you think about that? That's a question, what, at the very beginning of a question. So he says, suppose I tell you, you can't laugh anymore. You no know, laughing allowed. I mean, totally, no more laughing. You can't do that, can you? No. No, so that's a question. You can't do that, can you? That's a question. And how do, how do the students answer it? No. They said, no, can't do that, nah. That would be too serious, right? Too sad, too boring. Too boring if you couldn't laugh anymore, right? So do you remember when the lecturer says, does laughing make you feel good or bad? Yeah, and everybody said, good, right. So what is that, is that a statement or a question? That's a question. Does laughing make you feel good or bad? That's a question. So that's another question that the lecturer asked the audience. And he said, well, generally it makes you feel good, great, happy, doesn't it? Doesn't it? How about when he says, doesn't it? That's a question also. We call that a tag question. That's one of the kinds of questions that we're studying in this chapter. A statement plus a tag. That's what we call a tag question. That makes you feel good, great, happy, doesn't it? So that's another form of question. Then the lecturer also said, as a matter of fact, laughter is a great thing. That's why we've all heard the saying. What saying? Laughter is the best medicine. OK, that's the saying. All right, we have many sayings or many expressions. And we use this saying, laughter is the best medicine, to say laughter can cure a lot of sadness and depression and unhappy feelings and maybe even some illnesses. Now, do you remember when the lecture said, but did you ever stop to think about it? Is that a statement or a question? That's a question. He asked a lot of questions. But did you ever think? Did you ever stop to think about it? What does that mean? Did you ever stop to think about what? Laughter. About laughter. Did you ever stop to think about laughter? Probably not. Maybe we just laugh. We just enjoy laughing, but we don't think about laughter. Um, do you remember when the, the, the lecturer asked a few questions like this? He said, what is laughter? How does laughter work? Why do we laugh? Yeah. Does laughter have any benefits? Yes. Did you hear those four questions? Mm -hmm. Those are all questions. So when we look at this chart on page 177, and we look at the various possible ways 
that an instructor can begin a lecture, we see that he, he didn't do all of them, but certainly he did ask a lot of questions. He asked questions of the students. Some of the questions were directly about the students, why are you laughing? Uh, do you think you could stop laughing if I said no more laughing? Then these four questions, he says, what is laughter? How does laughter work? And why do we laugh? Does laughter have any benefits? These four questions, he, do, he, doesn't, give any, he doesn't give any answers yet. Did you hear any answers to the questions in this introduction? No. Did the students answer the questions? No. The students did not answer. So some questions, the instructor asked the students and they answered. And then some questions, the teacher asked them, but nobody answered them. Why? Because he's going to introduce these, the answers to the questions in his whole lecture. So this is a way for you to get a preview of the lecture. Do you know preview? That means you get, before you see the whole lecture, or before you hear the whole lecture, you get an idea what are the topics or the subtopics. So we know the topic is laughter. What are the subtopics of today's lecture? So sometimes a lecture will say, I'm going to talk about A, B, C, and D. And sometimes they don't tell you I'm going to talk about. Sometimes they ask a question. And they say, what is laughter? I'm going to tell you about it. Why do we laugh? I'm going to tell you about it. Is there any benefit? I'm going to tell you about it. OK, yeah. so sometimes a lecturer introduces the, the subtopics by asking the questions in order for you, the audience, to start thinking about it. Because questions make you wonder, what's the answer? right? So that's one way when you're listening to other lecturers. You know, everybody has a different lecture style. And even one person doesn't do the lecture in the same way. So I want you to be aware of different styles, of different ways that an instructor or a speaker of any kind introduces some, gives you a preview, and introduces some of the major ideas that will be presented later in the lecture. Now, I divided this into five different parts. Remember the first part is the introduction, so what are the other four parts? What are the other four parts then? Yeah, it's like how does, how does laughter occur? What makes laughter happen? Yeah, and that's a physiological uh, description of laughter. Yes, okay, and then what's coming after that? The sociological effects of laughter, yeah, what happens with us between people, and what else? Medical effects of laughter, how laughter helps the body, right? What else? And psychological, psychological effects of laughter, how it works on our body and our emotions, yeah? Good. So those are all, uh, in, those are all parts of what will come later in today's lecture. Now, he, he said that a lot of interesting research has been done on, on the subject of laughter. Okay, so I want you to know we use the word to do research, and we also use the word to conduct research. Do you know the verb conduct? Do you remember this word, conduct? This is a verb. What does it mean to conduct? This is one of your academic vocabulary words. It means to manage or to do it or to direct it. Okay? So when you, you say to conduct research, also we can say, for example, if you are a musician and maybe you play the violin and somebody else plays the bass, another person plays the piano and some people play the trumpet, what do we call the person who stands up going? What do you call that person? Uh, yeah. The conductor. Yeah. That person is called the conductor, and that person conducts the orchestra so that you play at the time, and you play the right time, and, and the, 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 the right rhythm and the right beat. Okay, so conduct and conductor. So we also use this word for to conduct research, to do research or to conduct research. So when learning vocabulary, you often need to learn what we call collocations. What words go together? So with the word research, do we say make research? No. 
Do we say to conduct research? Yes. So we know those two words go together. They are collocations. They, they, they are phrases that go together. So a lot of interesting research has been conducted. Do you understand passive voice? Yeah. Passive voice? So for example, if I say, I have conducted research, that's active voice. She has conducted research, that's active voice. They have conducted research. All of us have conducted research. This is active voice. If we don't talk about who did it, we can use passive voice. And we can say, a lot of research has been conducted, and that is a passive voice, has been conducted. Past participle, conduct, conducted, conducted. So past participle, conducted. A lot of research has been conducted on the subject of laughter. Yeah. So um, some scientists approach laughter from what point of view? The physiological point of view. That means what? In other words, the way your body functions to make laughter. Okay, physiological. Can I hear you say this? Physiological. Physiological. Very nice. Physiological. Physiological. Okay. In other words, the way your body functions to make laughter. And uh, how about other researchers? They don't all do the same thing, right? So other researchers approach laughter from a psychological point of view. Psychological point of view. That is the way laughter affects your mind and emotions. Okay, let me hear you say psychological. 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 Psychological point of view. Right, so other researchers approach laughter from a psychological point of view. That is the way laughter affects your mind and your emotions. And still others approach this topic from a sociological point of view. Sociological. Go ahead, let me hear you say sociological. Sociological. Very nice. So, so, so we have some from physiological, some from psychological, some from sociological. Good. So we have three so far. Sociological viewpoint. That means they examine how laughter works in a social environment when you're having interactions, social interactions. And how about people in the health profession? People in the health profession approach laughter from a... What's the fourth one? Starts with M. Medical. Medical. A medical viewpoint. So listen to, listen to the idea. The people in the health profession approach laughter from a medical viewpoint. A medical viewpoint. They show how laughter affects a person's illness and overall health. Got that. So what are the four? What are the four we have? Psychological and medical and what else? Physiological and sociological. Good. You got all of them. Okay. So if you can hear, you can hear those when he gives his introduction, when he's giving you a preview, he's talking about those four. You should keep those four in mind. And when you're taking notes on this, you should make sure you have four categories because later in his lecture, he will give you more information. So if you put the four categories on your page like this, then in between, you can put more notes to make sure you have the details. So remember, we have main ideas, and then we have details, and then we have some examples to support each one. Shall we listen to the second part now? All right, so the second part of the lecture is actually going to go into some more detail, and this detail is about, um, about the, uh, which part? Medical or psychological or physiological? Which one? Do you remember what's coming next? You guys listen to it? Physiological. Good. Okay, good. You know, I think I'll stop here and because the, I'm, I'm looking at that coming in activity 12. Maybe what we should do is look at what happens in transitions first. So let's do that first, okay? So in the transitions,
when we go to page 178 and 179, we're looking at some, um, some transitions that are used between synonymous phrases. Do you remember the word synonym? Synonym. 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 What is a synonym? A synonym. It's a word that has the same meaning as a diff another word. Okay, so if we say small and little are synonyms, right? So they are synonyms, meaning they have the same meaning. How many syllables do you hear in the word synonym? Synonym. 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 Three. Synonym. Where's the stress? Synonym. Synonym. One. Okay, watch me. Synonym. Very good. Let me let me see it again. Synonym. Again. Synonym. Okay, be careful. Some of you are having trouble with your N and your M. Okay, watch me. Synonym. Do you have your mirror? Take a look at your mirror because some of you are not sure what you're doing with your lips. Synonym. 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 Nim. Nim. Look at your lips, please. Yeah. Nim. 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 Synonym. Okay, look at your lips and say it five times. Blanca. Nim. Synonym. Synonym. Yes. Okay, good, good. Okay, so now I want to teach you a word that's in the same family, but it's an adjective. And I want you to listen to it because when you look at it on paper, it looks very similar to it. But when you hear it, it's different because the stress is different. Synonymous. 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 So we add O-U-S to the end. But the stress changes. It's not on the first syllable anymore. Where is the stress for synonymous? Synonymous. Synonymous. Where is the stress? Synonymous. Synonymous. For two. Okay, watch me. Synonymous. Synonymous. Very good. Again. Synonymous. Very nice. Again, synonymous. synonymous. So we can say synonymous phrases. Synonymous phrases. Synonymous phrases. Synonymous All right. So we can say big and small. Oh, sorry, no. Sorry. Uh, little and small are synonyms. They are synonymous. They are synonymous words. All right, we'll use the word in terms of phrases because there are more than one word. Now, let's talk about paraphrases. Paraphrases. What does paraphrase mean? Do you know? Paraphrase. What is a, what is a paraphrase? Have you heard this word? Some of you have heard of it, but you're not sure about the meaning, right? Paraphrase. All right, For, let me give you an example. All right, remember we always talk on the phone, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so for example, I get a phone call, and then, you know, I'm hearing, I'm listening, I'm listening to my friend talking about all the stuff that had just happened and what she did today, and da-da-da-da. Then I hang up the phone, and maybe my husband says, okay, who was that? What did she say? Then, I don't repeat everything my friend said, but I take the information, and I give a summary of, of it in my own words, the way I understood. The way I interpreted it, then I say it to him, but it's not exact dialogue. I'm not telling him the dialogue, right? So it's like when we do, we practice our retelling in class. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're doing retelling, you're paraphrasing, you're getting the most important information, and you're giving it out to your classmates when we do that activity. So paraphrasing means to take the main ideas, and maybe a few examples, and tell somebody, and you're using your own words. You're not, it's not a dictation. It's not like you're trying to get exact words, but you're trying to get the main ideas out. So paraphrasing means to say something 
maybe in a different way, okay? So sometimes what we do is we use synonyms or we use synonymous phrases in order to make something that's new or a little bit difficult easier to understand, all right? So that's what we do sometimes when we want to try to explain a word or a concept to make it easier to understand, especially if it's new or if it's difficult. Now, sometimes we use a transition phrase. Do you know the word transition? Yeah. What is a transition? Transition. Okay, so a transition phrase is a word or a phrase. Well, let's just take the word transition. Do, do you understand the word transition? Okay, for example, I'll, I'll do another context, not grammar, all right? Not grammar. So how, how about when you moved to this country, was that an easy or difficult transition for you? What does that mean? Oh, you all say difficult. Okay, so you understand the meaning of transition. It's a change. You move from one to another. You, were from, you move from one country to another, one language to another language, one culture to another, you know, one system to another. So it, is, it means some sort of connection between one thing and another. That's what a transition is. So when we talk about a transition in language, we're talking about how we connect this idea here with that idea there. So you'll hear one phrase or sentence here, you'll hear another one, but there's some sort of connecting word or connecting phrase that helps you make the transition. So, for example, sometimes you have to transition from something easier to something harder, yeah. right? Like in your life, maybe you found it the difficult situation coming to this country. But then maybe you go back to your country and then the transition will be easier. Maybe. Although sometimes people tell me when they go back, because they got used to this place, then they go back and they have reverse culture shock. And they go back, oh my goodness, did I used to live here? <laughs> and then everything changed, you know? And then a lot of changes happen in your own country. So anyway, a transition means how to make the change. So in, in language, we have some words. For example, in fact, that is, I mean, what I mean to say is, these are some phrases that we use to connect two ideas, especially when the two ideas are synonymous, when they have the same meaning, or when the second one explains the first one. So you remember when we studied um, in chapter two, we were studying about nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? So when we studied in chapter two, we heard the, 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 the lecturer say to us, how many meals will you have consumed in your lifetime? I mean, all together in your whole life. All right, do you remember that sentence? Yes. So how does she connect those things? She used the word, the phrase, I mean, right? So there are two sentences, and they have the same meaning. Mm -hmm. And one refers back to the first one. So we have the transition, I mean, and you have the synonymous phrases. What are they? In your whole life is a phrase. This phrase refers back to and means the same thing as in your lifetime, right? Okay, so in this exercise, we ask you to put a box around the transition phrase, and then we want you to underline the two synonymous phrases, and then show an arrow connecting, um, connecting the two together. In the second example, also from Chapter 2, Nutrition, you remember that the lecturer said, one important point to keep, for you to keep in mind now is this, a well-chosen diet, that is, your choice of foods, your diet, will keep you healthy. You remember that? Yeah. Okay, so what's the transition here? That is. That is. Now, I want you to know, when you see the two words, that and is, we don't always pronounce them the same way. Watch me. Watch me. If I use the word that as a demonstrative pronoun, I can say, that is my book, that is a table, 
That is the screen. That is a whiteboard. Right? I can point at these. That is my dot cam. Right? I can use the word that as a demonstrative. But here in this phrase, we don't say it that way. We say it like this. That is. That is. That is. And that, when you hear it in that way, you know it's a transition. It's a transition word. If you hear that is, then we're looking for what? What is? What, what, what is? Oh, that, that is my water bottle, right? So it's important to hear the stress. And of course, when you're speaking, it's important to stress the word correctly so other people will understand you, all right? So when you hear the way that people use that is, that is, the stress is on the is. And do you hear how the words are linked together? That is. That is. Right. So she says, one important point for you to keep in mind now is a well-chosen diet, that is, your choice of foods, your diet, will keep you healthy. In this case, the, 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 um, the lecturer actually has three phrases that have the same meaning. What are they? What are the three synonymous phrases here? No, not in other words. That, that choice, choice of foods. Choice of foods means diet. diet. Yes, your choice of food means your diet. diet. Okay, so she uses the word twice, the word diet twice. She says a well-chosen diet. All right, and then she explains that is your choice of foods. So when somebody says to you, what does diet mean? What does diet mean? You can say, well, your diet is your choice of foods, the kind of foods that you put, that you consume, right? Now, the third one um, is also from chapter two, nutrition. An ingredient, oh, sorry, a nutrient is an ingredient in your diet that has nutritious qualities. In other words, it nourishes or promotes growth. All right, so do we see the transition? Yeah. What is the transition? What did you put out? In other words, so that's where you put the box here around. In other words, and listen to the stress. In other words, in other words, watch me, watch me. In other words, good. Did you make a difference in your pronunciation when you watch me? Yes, you did. You really made a difference in your pronunciation. You were watching me stress that syllable. So keep your eyes open, move your body. In other words, no. now that's beautiful, beautiful. Okay, remember the link the word, to link the words together. So in other words means I'm going to tell you another way to say the same thing. What are, what are the things that are synonymous? Well, nourishes or promotes growth means has nutritious qualities. Okay, so those are the two phrases that you're going to underline for that. Now, number four, this sentence came from chapter three on geography. I'm sure you'll remember this one. Geography is more than the study of land. What I mean to say is geography is the study of land and people. Okay, so what do you hear as the transition phrase? What I mean to say is, so that one you have a long rectangle, a long box around what I mean to say is, so that's a long transition phrase, so sometimes they're short, that is, only two words. In other words, it's three words, and then you have a whole sentence, what I mean to say is. Now what are the synonymous phrases? The study of land and people. Okay, so the study of land and people, underline that one and put an arrow back to what? More than the study of land, right? So at the beginning, it's more than the study of land. Well, land plus what else? Land and people. So that explains it. Now, how about number five? This one comes from chapter four on sleep. Sleep is a state of complete perceptual disengagement from the environment. That means we can't perceive anything around us. Okay, so what kind of transition phrase do we have here? What are we putting in the box? That means, right, that means. 
That means what? Okay, we can't perceive anything around us. Now this phrase is easier to understand, right? We can't perceive, smell it, taste it, see it, hear it, feel it. We can't perceive anything around us. So this phrase, this sentence, this idea refers back to, explains a state of complete perceptual disengagement. That phrase, the first one, is very difficult to understand, not only for you ESL students, but even for native speakers, this concept is difficult. The vocabulary is difficult. So often, the speaker will say the new idea and then explain it in the second part. So another thing I want to teach you is this. Sometimes when you listen to conversation or a lecture and you feel like, oh, I can't get anything, just wait a minute because maybe the first difficult part will be explained in the next half of the sentence, okay? So sometimes if the explanation comes, then you say, oh, that means the same thing as the first part, all right? So sometimes you just have to be patient with yourself and say, I don't understand this new idea or this new vocabulary. It seems so difficult. And the teacher still says, well, what I mean to say is, or in other words, or another way to say this is, and then they say it in an easier way, like we can't perceive anything around us. That's a lot easier to understand. Now, all of these five cases have transition phrases, but we can also make paraphrases without a transition. We can also have this sentence and this sentence next to each other, but no transition phrase in between. For example, from chapter one on music, you remember this sentence, music stirs people's emotions, their feelings. It moves them emotionally, right? Do you remember that sentence? Yeah. So do you see any, do you hear any transition between the two sentences? No. no. But the second sentence means the same thing. So when you say, it moves them emotionally, that means the same thing as music stirs people's emotions, okay? So that's a way that the teacher has given you two ways to say the same thing, all right? Synonymous phrases. Let's go to number seven. Sleep debt doesn't go away. No way. It grows. It accumulates. The larger that you lose, the, the, sorry, the sleep that you lose on successive nights increases progressively as a larger and larger sleep debt. That's from chapter four, right? So here, transition? None. Yeah. But there's an explanatory phrase about grows. So grows, expands on, doesn't go away. You know, go away means diminishes, but expands is the opposite. So it's telling you it doesn't diminish, it doesn't go away, it doesn't decrease, it actually expands, it increases. And you have the synonymous phrase accumulates, and what does that mean? It means grows, right? And then we have the summary sentence. On top of all of that, the teacher tells you another paraphrase. The sleep that you lose on successive nights. That means night after night after night after night. That means successive nights increases progressively. Progressively means little by little, little by little, little by step by step, day by day, night by night, week by week, month by month. Okay, so it increases progressively as a larger and larger sleep debt. So if we just say larger, what's the difference between larger and larger and larger? What's the difference? When you, when you say something twice, what does it mean? Bigger and bigger. Okay, so it means increasing, increasing, increasing. Okay, not a small and then suddenly large, but larger and larger. So actually we have several ways to say the size increases step by step. One of them is successive. Another is progressively. And another one is larger and larger. 
So the teacher uses all of this language to help explain that sleep debt accumulates step by step, night by night. You don't get rid of it right away. It accumulates over a long period of time. And it also shows you that she gives all of these paraphrases, all of these synonymous phrases, without a transition. OK, let's look at page 180, because you'll see that now we're up to our own lesson in chapter 5. We just reviewed some sentences from our previous lectures. Now look at the lecture from um, this, this topic on laughter. And we have three, we have three transition phrases that we're practicing here, we're listening for. The one, first one is, I mean, I mean, I mean, OK, pay attention to your stress. I mean, I mean, that is, that is, that is, that is, that is, in other words, 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 in other words. Good. All right. Now, when you listen to the CD, I'm sure you found out what the transition is for number eight. No laughing aloud. What was the transition? I mean. I mean. I mean. Okay. And what was the following? What came after that? I mean what? Totally, no more laughing. No laughing aloud. I mean, totally, no more laughing. Good. Number eleven. Number nine. Some scientists approach laughter from a physiological point of view. In other words, in other words, what? The way your body functions to make laughter. The way your body functions to make laughter. Good. All right. And number 10, other researchers approach it from a psychological point of view. Is it? All right. Should we say that is or shall we say that is? Good point. That is? That is. All right. That is what? The way laughter affects your mind and your emotions. Right. That is the way laughter affects your mind and emotions. Now, the lecturer does not use transitions before all of the paraphrases. So in number 11 and number 12, there aren't any transitions. So we just need to write the keywords for that. So we have number 11, still others approach this topic from a sociological viewpoint. They examine, they examine how laughter works in social interaction. Very good. They examine how laughter works in social interaction. In a number 12, and people in the health profession approach laughter from a medical viewpoint. What do you have for that? They show how laughter affects a person's illness and health. Right, okay. They show how laughter affect a person's illness and health. How are you doing? Is it good? Yeah. Do you have any questions? 